So we've heard a lot over the last two days of really interesting content about how the world is changing, the technologies that are disrupting our world and how the customer's needs are changing. So I'm really gonna focus on three follow-ups to that, which we hear all the time from clients. The first is, what's different? Uh, for 30 years, we've been hearing that technology is gonna change our world. What's different this time round? Secondly, we keep hearing about unleashing the potential of our people. What does that really mean? How do we go about making sure that our people can really respond to the world that's changing? And the final piece, which is quite an important one, is where is the money in all of this? Because every time we look at the technology story, it's about things getting cheaper, getting faster, less profit, less, more transparency. The question is, where is the money in the new world that's emerging that will pay for all these changes that we're, we're talking about making? So that's what I'm gonna focus on in my presentation. And I make no apologies for leading with people because throughout history, what we've seen is that big technological change programs generally fail. Something like 70 to 90% fail. And they never fail because we made a mistake with the technology. They, made a, they fail because we haven't understood what we're trying to do. The people haven't bought in. We haven't adapted the culture. We haven't changed the power hierarchies in the organization. So we try and replicate what we did before in the new technologies. So the real challenge now is about how do we make sure we take people with us and really build their capacity to respond with these technologies in a powerful way. And the other thing that became very clear yesterday from all three presentations and what we heard this morning is that no one have a right, has a right to exist anymore. Every single industry is being asked very tough challenge questions. We're seeing people come along who are saying, I'm gonna win in your industry, but you're just another thing I'm going to do. So whereas insurance is everything you do, insurance is just another tab on the screen for someone like Google or Facebook. And so they look at you completely differently. The players coming in aren't bound by your rules. What we also know is that for all our work as researchers, futurists, consultants, advising companies across the globe, the people who are not surprised by the future don't do it by accident. They have a very conscious approach to looking at the future, and they think about three time horizons. Firstly, they're very clear on what do we have to do in the next 12 months? What do we have to bring into land? And they don't have 400 priorities, all of which they say are equal, uh, and they've discovered that half of them don't get delivered each year and we just push them to next year. They're very clear on the few things we have to do that are really gonna move the needle and move our organization forward and make us fundamentally different. They're also very, very clear on where executive time goes. If you want to see grown adults cry, you make them write down everything they did last year, and then you ask them to rate each of the key things they spent their time on from one to 10 in terms of how much time value it added to the organization. And then you multiply that and you get a score out of 100. Uh, very rarely for senior executives is that more than 30 because so much of what we think is absolutely urgent and critical today, we'll have forgotten about in three months' time. We just don't spend enough time focusing on the stuff that's really gonna move our organizations forward. We get too stuck in what we're doing today, and we don't spend enough time on what's coming next or delegating more and more of that to our people so that we can focus on the future. The second piece we find about the organizations that do really well is that they're, they're looking out. They're saying, where is innovation going to come from? Where is growth going to come from? And what might change in the world around them, around us that will help us, that might give us some new options or that might get in the way of our thinking or challenge our thinking? And the final one is they have an early warning system. They have a radar where they're looking four to 10 years ahead and they're saying what's coming in four to 10 years time. Now maybe we can't do anything with that today, but if we understand it, we can build some different scenarios for how our world might play out. So we've seen people storing information on a single drop of water, a million books 
on a single drop of water. But if your IT director came to you and said, OK, I want to build a water-based data architecture, within about 10 seconds, you would be calling for medical assistance for them. They would be out the door. But we can build some scenarios to say that if we know where that's going, actually what we're going to do is reduce our reliance on internal technology. And more and more, we're going to build a model that says we're going to use external partners who are, going to move, who are able to move fast with the technology. And what we can then do is to say, let's use those scenarios of different possible futures to make sure that in the next two or three years, we're becoming flexible enough, innovative enough, and forward thinking enough so that we can respond to whatever might come in the future. And you know, the next three years is about a boot camp, if you like, really getting our organization changing in the way it thinks, in the way it behaves, in the way it leads, and the capacity of our people. And what we also know is if we look around us, there are some stories we're hearing. We've heard about globalization for a long time and technology, but underlying that, there are some common stories we're starting to see emerging about the forces shaping our world. We don't have time to go through all of these, but in a sense, you'll recognize all of these. And the great thing about all of these is there are euro signs behind these. All of these are market opportunities in the way life is changing. But we just have to think differently about how we're going to use data to create opportunities in these market spaces. And perhaps the biggest thing that's changing is that people get it now. We, we keep hearing about millennials. They, in particular, get that the world is going to change quite dramatically, that technology is going to reshape our world, and that the whole notion of work might change. Whether we have a job or not in 10 to 15 years' time may not be so guaranteed. It may not be an organizing principle for our world. So more and more people are saying, I want purpose. Work used to give me purpose. Family used to give me purpose. But all of that is being challenged now. And there is that question of, why am I here? What is my purpose? How do I feel fulfilled in life? And you saw some of that come through in the, in the survey data yesterday. And increasingly, we're having to deal with this. We're having to understand this and work out how do we help our people see a purpose in the future, even if we're saying the automation projects we're doing might take you out of a job. We've got to help people fulfill their purpose, whether or not they're still with us. And we also know that this core organizing platform that's changing our world is like a monster that's encompassing everything. It started off as a, a way of exchanging information. And then it moved to relationships with social media. Now we're into the Internet of Things, where everything is becoming connected to the Internet. And finally, we're moving into the Internet of Money, where everything that we used to think we had a monopoly on can now be done over the Internet. Actuarial activity, risk assessment, product distribution, even the creation of new money. The Internet is becoming the space where all of that can happen. And it means that no one has a monopoly on delivering those services. And really what we're seeing is a collision as a result between two different worlds. On the one hand, there are those of us who are born in the physical world. We make cars, we build houses, we do insurance. We see the world still in a very physical way. Even though the policy is electronic, we still see it as a piece of paper. We still think about it as a very physical object. We're now, we use technology, but we see it as something we use inside our business, not what our business is. We're now colliding with a world of people who are born digital. So we've heard a lot about Google. Well, Google is a classic example. They don't see data. Uh, they don't see cars, houses, insurance policies. All they see is data. And they believe that if you can get the data in any industry, you can then create new products and solutions for that industry based on what the customer wants, particularly if you own the customer relationship. So they have the world's biggest search engine. They run two airports. They have the biggest selling mobile phone operating system. They have the driverless car that's driven more kilometers than anyone else. They have a company that hopes to extend your life expectancy by 50 years. How do you motivate a 110-year-old CEO? <laughs> We're entering a very interesting space right now where the new players see everything as data. Everything is data. And our challenge is about how do we start to think that way? How do we start to develop the mindset 
that these people have? And the answer is we already have it, we just ignore it. A huge number of people inside our organization are already thinking that way, but they're hitting barriers. They take the ideas up, the organization, and they get knocked back. Or they're told they're not allowed to think that way. Or we tried that once 10 years ago, it didn't work, so we can't do it. And the real challenge is about letting go, is about opening up so that the talent we have that is just as good as Google's or better, so that, that talent has the opportunity to really flourish. And what we see is that in the face of this, some organizations are doing better than others. So we heard about United yesterday. The interesting thing about the United story is that we all knew what the right answer was. If we had said to any of you, we're going to send those security guards onto the plane, we're going to drive that 69-year-old man off, and the whole plane is full of people with smartphones and social media accounts, you don't have to be PR trained to know that that's a very bad move. And yet, United is so much thinking like a machine that it lost sight of its people. And its people didn't feel empowered enough to do the right thing for the customer or courageous enough to do the right thing for the customer or the organization because they could have taken those four members of staff, put them in a taxi and sent them from St. Louis, uh, Chicago to St. Louis they could have stopped twice for great meals. They could have bought them all a nice gift from Nordstrom's, and it would have still cost less than $1,000. Taking four passengers off the plane cost them $4,000 because they had to give them $800 and a hotel room and meals. Our challenge is how do we get beyond machine thinking? And then you look, British Airways recently had the problem where 75,000 passengers were stranded around the world because their computer systems failed. Apparently, a contractor switched off one switch that switched off not only their computer system, but the backup system. Now, even Windows 8 gives you an option to say, are you sure? But somehow, <laughs> they did that. At that point, everything that British Airways did since then has been about how they're going to fix their systems problem not what they're going to do to make life better for the 75,000 stranded passengers. But had British Airways taken 10 minutes to look outside at the world, it could have said, we could fix this at very low cost. We could use the Uber or Airbnb model. Where around the world, there are literally hundreds of thousands of travel agents who we could give access to our systems in a crisis. We could automatically allocate each passenger when they're booked to a travel agent. And if there's a crisis, that travel agent can contact the person and re rebook them onto another flight. They could probably call them before they even know there's a problem. And we're only going to pay that, that travel agent for that little transaction. But think about the brand benefit of doing that. So what we've got is a mindset blockage in a lot of organizations where we're not standing in the shoes of the customer or the shoes of our staff and saying, how do we organize to make sure we can deliver the kind of service they really want and our people feel like the organization is supporting them to do that. Uh, contrast that with my favorite app at the moment. This is a, a, a banking app called Monzo. Any of you here seen it? One hand here, great. Tell everyone else about it. This is, this is uh, when you look at most banking apps, you can see the structure of the organization in the app. If you spend 10 minutes, you can work out who won the arguments about what we can and can't do, or what the customer can and can't do with their own money. Monzo is completely different. If I go to a typical app to buy insurance, travel insurance, and I have the crime of forgetting to buy it before I travel, I want to buy three days insurance, I might have to pay for 10. Monzo, if I want three days insurance, I pay for three days insurance because there's no human involved in that process. It's an entirely technological process. It's only data moving around. And their entire business is based on understanding the customer and their behavior, and then creating solutions around that, and then working out how do we make money out of doing it. And it's entirely driven that way from the relationship and owning the front end. And we're in a very interesting world right now in terms of how we view that emerging future as a result of these mindset shifts. Because one view, and we've heard this a few times, is it's a winner-takes-all world, it's a Star Wars world, uh, it's all about 
grabbing the most land we can, eliminating the competition, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then there's another view that says, actually, it's less like Star Wars and more like Star Trek. The first Star Trek was based on the, an abundance model where actually there was no money. Whatever you wanted, you got for free. There's people saying that actually in the next seven to 10 years, if we do it right, the global economy could grow from $78 trillion to about $120 trillion. More than 50% of that will come from businesses and industries that have either just been born or do not yet exist. I think that, that smells like an opportunity. That's where the new opportunities come for insurance, where whilst a lot of other stuff we're doing is getting commoditized. But we need the people to go out and learn about those industries, to talk to the synthetic biology industry and understand what it means to create a new molecule that will clean up pollution and understand the insurance risks and help them develop insurance products or give them software platforms, which I think is one of the big futures for the industry, where we give them risk assessment tools, investment tools, and packaging tools so they can create their own products. And we're providing the platforms. So we're not having to work out everything for every industry. We're letting them do it for themselves as they're born. But we're using that talent that we're freeing up through technology to go out and win new business and new markets, to work with these industries as they're being born, to say, how do we create the, the right kind of insurance profile and product for what you're doing? And when you think about the number of trillion dollar sectors coming through, that's quite an interesting opportunity to go after, to say, how do we, how do we re enthuse ourselves if we're losing some enthusiasm or we're worried about competition? and commoditization, well, we start to go after the new and the next and what's coming after that. And we start to work on the future waves of growth. And what we see is there are a lot of technologies coming together that are creating the next wave of opportunities. These are moving at exponential speed and they're combining and they're being powered in many cases by AI underneath. So for example, four dimensional printing will give us vehicles where the body panels will reshape after an accident. As an insurer, that's quite an interesting proposition, isn't it? Do we invest in the body panel manufacturer? Where do we, where do, you know, what do we do to play in this world? It take the food industry. Four years ago, Mark Prost in his laboratory in Amsterdam created the world's first laboratory-grown hamburger. It cost about 325,000 euros and it tasted like your shoes. Last year, same laboratory, same hamburger, now 11 euros. Apparently, it now tastes like Burger King beef. I'm a vegetarian, so someone else will have to tell me if there's a taste improvement. But that will be about 50 cents in two years' time. That is exponential, and we're seeing this in industry after industry, where the game is being changed by people bringing radically new thinking to bear. Now, we can either choose to see that as a risk, or see that as a massive opportunity, because I can guarantee you that the people coming up with these ideas are not starting off by thinking about what are the risks or what do I need to insure against. Uh, last year, there was a group created what was called a digital autonomous organization, a technology only business that was a venture capital fund. It raised about 180 million euros online. Uh, and it was written entirely in software, no human employees. AI basically was used to do the decision making about what to invest in based on the votes of the investors. It ran on blockchain, it ran on a platform called Ethereum. Not once did the 24 year old Italian developer of the system think about legal regulation, insurance risk or accounting risk. And actually someone found a feature in the code that allowed them to take almost half of the money out and put it into their own fund. And because blockchain is anonymous, they don't know who it was. But there was no protection for the investors because no one had thought about that. Now, on the one hand, you'd say, well, that's terrible, that's highly risky. On the other hand, you could say, there are about 5,000 projects out there creating these digital autonomous organizations right now all of whom are going to have to manage those kinds of risks. 
How do we get alongside them? How do we become the first insurance companies to be thinking about these things and pioneering the ideas? In legal, you're starting to see this happen now. People becoming the pioneers in, in assessing the risks, identifying the legal issues around new industries based on blockchain, based on AI. And what we, what we understand here is we are becoming a computerized world. We're literally everything in our world is going to become a computing device of some sort over time. Uh, this year, we've seen people put sensors on bananas. Now, you might laugh, but when we say that 40% of all the fresh food in the world is wasted, if we know where that food is and we can track it, we can dramatically reduce the amount of waste in the food chain. And we can change that. And as an insurer who might be insuring against that, then suddenly we become interesting. We also know that we've been able to do computing calculations on bacteria or with bacteria. So literally everything, including the human body, is moving towards becoming a computing device. And we heard yesterday a lot about artificial intelligence, if you like, the mother of all technologies. And the reality here is it is moving at a pace way faster than anything that any of us can understand. Uh, Stephen talked yesterday about Google's DeepMind uh, beating um, the AlphaGo system, beating the World Go champion. The interesting thing about that was in all four games where AlphaGo won, the, uh, Lisa Dole, the, the seventh Dan Go champion, retired stressed. It wasn't like checkmate in chess. Basically, the machine was outthinking him. It was coming up with more creative moves than he could imagine, moves he'd never seen before, but it was also deliberately making him make false moves. It was gaming him. Now, that was what Stephen was saying was 20 years ahead of where we thought it was. Some people were saying 10 years. That system was brilliant at playing Go. It learned how to play Go. It learned the rules. Over here, you have IBM with Watson that's getting very good do at doing things like insurance risk assessment or being applied to diagnosing cancer. But if we tried to teach AlphaGo in its current form how to diagnose cancer, it would be get, get, become very good at it, but it would forget how to play Go. So it's smarter than humans in one domain right now. But the next generation of what's coming through in AI are called generative adversarial networks that think and behave much more like the human brain. So they will be able to learn and exercise multiple human intelligences in parallel. And that's where we need to really get our heads around this, is to say, do we understand this stuff and what's coming? Do we understand the potential impact for our business, but do we also understand the impact on the marketplace, which is much more interesting? The new industries it enables, the new ways of doing business it enables, and therefore the new insurance opportunities it enables. So simple things like with a car. We're talking about some sort of dynamic pricing with a car, but literally we could be pricing, we could have per second insurance contracts that say depending on the road conditions, depending on who else is on the road, will charge you a different amount all the time. Depending on the theft rates for cars in your street this week, will charge you a different rate for the insurance for your car. No human has to be involved in that because we've got enough accumulated data and we're accumulating enough data to be able to do that. We could literally create all sorts of fascinating products. There's a Japanese insurance company that insures you against getting a hole in one when you play golf. Because it's no laughing matter in Japan. If you get a hole in one, you have to buy gifts for all your friends. And the minimum is about $5,000. So if you're striking the ball sweetly, the first thing you do is not boast to your friends, it's get on your phone and get insurance. So we're moving into a world where literally every human activity becomes the potential for an insurance product. Take dating. Some of you may no longer be in that space where dating's an issue. I was divorced recently, so I'm back in that world. It's horrific. But the interesting thing is, uh, people are now starting to talk about getting insurance policies against bad dates. So at the, at the, at the kind of lowest level, you insure you know, for the cost of the meal. At the, at the other end, you insure for kind of psychological help if you know, it was a traumatic experience. 
we can insure against not enjoying a film. We can start to think about life and every area where there's pain or pleasure and think about how do we insure for that. Now I get that as a traditional set of insurance companies with history and all those things, those probably aren't the first things you think about when you think about your next product set. But I can guarantee you that that's exactly where the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons and those players who have infinite data are saying, where do we look? If you want to be shocked about how much data they have, under the Freedom of Information Act, you can go to Twitter, you can go to Google, you can go to Facebook, and you can ask them to give you all the data they have on you. In one week, Twitter generates more than 800 pages of information on you. Not just what you did on Twitter, but where you were, what else you searched on, what people you know did. It generates this incredibly sophisticated portfolio. So Twitter can tell that you're going into an area, or Google or Facebook can tell that you're going into an area with a higher crime rate. It can offer you some personal protection insurance there and then to say, you know, what if your car gets stolen or you get mugged? Do you want to buy for three euros insurance for that time? My guess is you wouldn't know about that at the time that they do. But this is what AI is allowing us to do. Imagine having just infinite amounts of data your bright people would work out these products. But what we're doing is building into AI the capacity to do this kind of thing. So you take um, driverless vehicles. Great idea. The question is, why do I need to own a car anymore? How many of you at the moment know where your car is? Or what it's doing? No, you think you know, right? But what if that car dropped you to work then took someone else to work, took someone to the theatre, someone else shopping. Basically, that car can become its own taxi. The auto manufacturers and investors are saying, well, why don't we make these self-owning assets? So they earn money all day long, and then they share the revenues with who manufactured them, who services them, who refuels them. We start to move into a world of self-owning assets. Not only are they self-owning, but with 4D printing, they become self-repairing and self-diagnosing. They can drive themselves to the garage for a repair. And finally, they can form into self-insuring pools with other cars on the road, where they just say, we'll take a proportion of our revenues, and in the same way as you're seeing crowdsourcing platforms like Guevara, we'll pool a certain amount of our revenue, and we'll insure each other on the road. This is no longer science fiction or science fantasy. We can do this today with AI. The more data we can get, the better we're going to get at pricing it. The really interesting thing about these platforms, and we heard earlier about you know, some of your companies now returning some money to your shareholders, most of the new platforms are based on the idea that you will get the money back at the end of the year, or most of the money back if we don't, if we don't have a claim. AI enables us to do that. AI enables us to take an insurance risk and literally shop it all around the world in a microsecond and find whoever's willing to underwrite it in that moment. That underwriting might not come from a traditional underwriter. It might come from a family office who says, actually, we've got 20 million euros today that we want to put somewhere. Or a, an investment banker who's just got their bonus and says, what do I spend it on? And you pop up on their screen and you say, well, you could underwrite this for today. Here's the return you could make. Again, we couldn't do that in the way we're configured, but the technology is going to allow these kinds of models. What all of this means is that we have to really make sure that the level of digital literacy in our businesses is sufficient that we understand the world we're moving into, we understand the new business models it's creating and enabling. Because without that, we're not going to be able to compete in this space. We also know we're moving to a world of near-perfect knowledge, where there will be sensors in everything. A hundred billion devices, a trillion sensors. This is a company called Dermot that makes what's called a smart mattress, which you can already buy. It has tens of sensors inside it. So it can tell you what is your best position to sleep in, when during the night do you get your best quality sleep, your most restless, restful sleep. It's also connected to your smartphone. And so they market this on the basis that you can find out 
if your bed is having fun while you're not in it. <laughs> but we're going to move into the world. So that starts to mean, well, actually, we can embed insurance into these products. Because the cost of divorce, as a result of the information, and we've got concrete evidence that your partner's had a, an affair, who pays for the cost of the divorce? Well, we could start to build into the product insurance. We start to create a lot of new products when we start to think about it. And then, you know, you've heard about blockchain. This is clearly the game changer. Most people are looking at this as a technology. Why would we want to do this? I think that's completely the wrong lens. This is about China saying, we've tried for quite a while to establish the renminbi as a rival currency to the US dollar. Uh, because the dollar, in a sense, controls global financial markets. If we wind the clock forward 10 to 15 years, it won't be so much the currencies that control global markets, it's the financial platforms that world trade happens on. And so they have a plan to put the whole of their economy, basically, on blockchain. So if you're worrying about whether blockchain will happen or not, I would say, you know, what is your level of confidence in China? and China's ability to change global markets. And if you think they might carry on doing quite well, then it's worth understanding blockchain and where it's going and how fast it's moving. What we're also seeing is people are using these technologies to open up new business models. So you, you, I think you had Yuri Van Geest a couple of years ago talking about exponential business models. We're seeing it move from technology to the physical world. So Airbnb has 90 times more customers, per, uh, more beds, per employee than the average hotel group. Uh, you look at people doing it at the other end, really simple things. You go through some airports now, five pieces of plastic allow us to load our luggage on the belt way faster than before, rather than one at a time. So it's, you know, it happens from the simplest to the most complex. In construction, this is Broad Group in China who build 57-story buildings in 19 days. They prefabricate and just plug it together like Lego on site. Uh, we're seeing this happen in industry after industry. In the auto industry, uh, these guys can come up with a new car design a thousand times cheaper than the average car company and manufacture the cars up to 22 times faster. Why? Well, the typical Ford has about 5,000 components. This is 3D printed and has 50. The typical car company needs to produce 50,000 cars from a factory in order to make a profit. These guys need to do 2,500. We're seeing exponential thinking hit every sector. And for you, that's an opportunity, both how do we bring exponential thinking into our organization, but also when we start to see these new exponential industries emerge, what new insurance possibilities uh, arise for us? Flying cars, we always think this is a fantasy. Dubai has tested single-user drones and wants to have them flying by the end of this year. So they'll take you to the airport or where there's congested traffic. We're starting to see the things that we thought were fantasy becoming reality. Hyperloop, this train service that would take you from LA to San Francisco in 30 minutes. We're seeing two or three being explored in Europe, a lot being explored across the Middle East. These will be incredible services that won't just ship people, they'll ship goods and, and, and water and all sorts of things at almost no cost. We're going to see every industry value chain being disrupted. Even the things like parenting, we could see an exponential increase in the number of parents a child has because of the new techniques in fertilization, where a child could have anywhere from three to 12 parents. Think about that. We're also in a world where we're kind of getting used to, you know, cash as an exchange. We're starting to think about Bitcoin and other digital currencies. But now my air miles, my store loyalty points can be traded and will be. My network is now a value to me. People want to advertise if I have a lot of followers. My blood, people are trading their blood for money uh, in, in various ways. You have blood services now. People are talking about financing education through regular blood donation. We're moving into a world where literally everything imaginable could become a tradable asset or a valuable asset. And this is why Facebook and Google wander around with such a big smile on their face. Because every single day they talk to more than a billion people, or more than a billion people have conversations on their platforms. Which means they know about our lifestyles. They can create these continuous insurance products. They can create banking products that do all sorts of things that we would never think about doing. They can trade my, you know, the space on my drive 
for people who want to park there. They can rent out my spare bedroom via Airbnb. They can find me an opportunity to drive via Uber or Lyft. They can you know, give my garage away to Amazon as temporary storage, and I don't have to do anything. They're providing the platforms where they are the interface to your world, and it just becomes another click. We're not going to compete with them by being better at the technology. We're going to be, compete with them by understanding it and coming up with better ideas and then finding the technologies to deliver for us. So in this world, what we're seeing is the technology is happening. And the so-called techno-progressives say, well, the, the answer is that technology will fix everything. Now, most of us are smart enough and experienced enough to know that that's not quite the case. Uh, and, and, and these guys are saying, actually, in order to win uh, with technology, you have to, you'll eventually have to become technology. The problem is, for most of us, we see it, we hear it, but we're not ready in our organizations. We've, we've accumulated a lot of baggage. We get these bright people, and then we make them do a lot of stuff that doesn't really add any value and makes it very hard for them to act when something new happens. Uh, and we're also constantly hearing these stories about how many jobs could disappear. And our staff are hearing this, and they're, they're wondering, well, what are you doing about that? You're automating, but what are you going to do to help me get a job or help me deal with the issues? And as I said, the, the technologists are saying that actually, if you want to survive in the future we're moving into, you're going to have to use the genetic implants, the electronic implants, take the cognitive enhancement drugs, cryogenically freeze yourself, all those things, in order to survive that world. Now, whether or not you like that, that's a huge opportunity from an insurance perspective, because all of these things are going to be services that people pay for. So the question becomes, well, how do we then make sure that we stay focused on humanity in this world we're moving into? And the first is, my guess is that not one of your businesses has people sitting there on a daily basis going, well, what shall I do for the next day? You know, everyone has a very full agenda, and normally way more than they can handle. So we have to stop some things in order to free up time for people to do some quality thinking and some quality learning. And that means stopping things. And the best way of doing that is because we can see that you know, 10 years' time, the world could be fantastic and totally different, and we could be servicing all those new markets. But where we are today, it all just looks very messy in terms of how we get there. So the first thing is we have to stop a lot of stuff. And the best way of working out what to stop is not to ask your executives. It's to ask your staff, what would you stop doing tomorrow if no one noticed? The meetings, the reports, etc. You spend four days writing a report, someone else spends one second reading one number on one page. How do we start to free up time and space to educate people and to start thinking about tomorrow? The next is, we have to develop digital literacy across the organization. We're now seeing and doing a lot of programs with top leadership where we're helping them understand these technologies and how they change the world and getting them to go and see the businesses that are creating the future. So you develop genuine digital literacy. You don't just send them PowerPoints or loads of information to read. You get them to engage with it at a physical level. And you do it all the way through the organization in different ways. The next is thinking about what are the skill sets that are going to help us navigate that future. What are those capabilities that our bright people are going to need to solve the more complex requirements of customers, to go and talk to new industries and new businesses, to co-create new insurance solutions, to define new self-service insurance platforms? And they're a very different skill set to the one we have today. One of the dirty little secrets we have in business is that we're very stressed, and mental health issues are rising. And particularly when professionals see that they're going to be replaced by the automation system they're training, they don't get excited by that. They get more stressed. So we have to acknowledge that and start to think about what support are we putting in for those people or even helping them retrain to become mental health professionals themselves. Um, around innovation, the, the risk is that in the face of all this, we try and create a million projects. We try and create thousands of projects. Actually creating a small number and doing very quick experimentation to move them forward and, and having very clear tests to say, what do we need to do in 15 days or 30 days? And if we're not doing it, then stop the project. So we're constantly testing ourselves. Around innovation, people always say to me, I don't know how to work with the insure tech companies. Well, one of the best ways is to set them challenges, have competitions where they pitch their ideas to you. 
or to have a fund where you're investing in a portfolio of them so that you're learning and you're creating new solutions for yourselves and new options. We've gone through a very rapid tour of some of the challenges we face around technology, how it's changing business, how it's creating new business models, where the opportunities might be, and how we make sure we have the capability in our organization to respond. My guess is when you go back and start talking to some of your colleagues, their instant, re their instant reaction won't be to stand up and applaud you. There will be some resistance, but we have to recognize that the world is changing and we can actually control the, the pace at which it happens to us by being proactive. The author Graham Greene says there comes a time in everyone's life when you have to open the door and let the future in. The reason I guess you guys are all at the top of your businesses and doing as well as you are is that you have a track record of having that door open. I hope I've just given you some ideas on what sits inside the other side of the door for people in particular and markets so that you can keep taking advantage of that. Thank you.